Okay, I'm not very good at this. Uh, so bear with me a bit. Uh, today's presentation was originally scheduled to be given by Kim McCush, who's currently the president of RISA. Unfortunately, she had some family obligations. I called her way at the last minute, so she asked me to step in. And I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience, and I also see a lot of folks that I haven't had the opportunity to meet yet. Hopefully, we'll get a chance to chat this weekend. I think at this point, probably a lot of people have heard something about RISA. There's, there's a little bit of mystery about it. We're not a very well publicized group. I think you'll be hearing more from us in the future as we get a bit more active. But just to give me a reference, uh, how many folks here are active rebreather divers currently? So just looks like about 90% of the folks. How many folks here think that the current safety record of rebreathers is acceptable? No hands? Okay. That's why we formed RISA. As Mark mentioned, we first started, I'm going to skip ahead one slide and then come back to our mission. Our first discussions took place in 2010 at Beneath the Sea. And for those of you that might have happened to be present that night, Kurt, Bowen, they were quite informal. And what happened was is a couple of manufacturers had an opportunity to sit down and talk about a few things that we had concerns about. And over the course of about 20 minutes, it became pretty clear that we agreed on a lot of things. And so we decided that, you know, this might be a good thing. If we want to grow the industry, there's, there might be something we can do to contribute. So we organized a meeting for the next day in a coffee shop that was attended by a few more folks to try and generate some interest. And we decided there that between BTS and DEMA, we'd make an effort to take the organization forward to actually get something going. And as Mark mentioned, Patty was kind enough to lend us the use of a room at DEMA. And we had pretty wide attendance from manufacturers, from training agencies, and a number of other of, uh, interested parties. And it looked like there was enough interest to go forward. And so then it became a question is, what is RISA going to be? What are our values? What's our mission? And that turned out to be a little bit more exciting than what we initially thought. Formed a bylaws committee, and the first thing we had to do is try and come up with, you know, a mission statement, a goal, or something around which to frame the qualifications. So, with a lot of discussion, we came up with a mission statement that the purpose was to improve safety and education worldwide, promote standards, improve development and promote the use of uh, quality assurance systems. And that sounds simple, but it wasn't that terribly simple to get going because we're consensus-based. So by about February of 2011, we had bylaws in place. We elected a set of officers and defined the standards for members. And so one of the discussions was is what is the organization going to be about? And we decided it needs to be a group of manufacturers that we talk about our common problems. We're all competitors. We continue to be competitors. The goal is not to design the perfect rebreather. So the regular members are basically manufacturers. We made one notable exception for that, which I'll mention in a few minutes. But we also know that we needed to interface with the training agencies. So training agencies basically have their own organizations that are similar to manufacturers. They, they work amongst themselves to help resolve their own issues. So they're more of a supporting role, and it gives us a way to interface with them. Associate members are designed to be basically manufacturers that don't quite meet our requirements, but they're working on them, and we want to get them into the fold. <clears throat> so again, it, there was a lot of discussion about what the minimum requirements should be. And we decided in order to promote our values, we had to establish some criteria. One of the criteria was is third-party testing to some form of recognized standards. And there's a couple of standards out there, but we're interested that manufacturers should know what the work of breathing on their unit is. They should know the scrubber durations. They should be tested to some mechanical standards. If they have electronics, the electronics need to meet some basic standard. They need to be an active manufacturer. They have to have units out there. They have to be making units so that they're relevant. 
they needed some sort of quality management system that's documented and third party audited. And what that boils down to in the reality of things is there's a handful of standards that are currently in use, probably CE, the norms that comprise the CE standard for rebreathers is one of the most well known and one of the most widely used because the units in the EU uh, have to be approved. There's the US Navy standard. NOAA has a standard that's based on, in part, on US Navy standards. So we, we decided to basically, as the norm, look at CE standards for testing and for quality assurance. Uh, pretty much the mantra is ISO 9000. Most all of us already had ISO, have had it for years. The new folks coming up, we were encouraging to get it. So with that in place, the initial members, uh, regular members, ambient pressure diving, and that's the inspiration, interspace systems, the MEG, Jetsum, it's the KISS, Poseidon, Mark VI, Revo, uh, Shearwater, our notable exception because Bruce's firm makes electronics for several different rebreathers, and he's been very active in the industry, and he's been very active within RISA and VR technology, the Sentinel. Supporting members, basically, you know, they need to be individuals or firms that are engaged in operations that are beneficial to the industry. And basically what we're talking about here is training agencies. They're a critical part of the industry. So after a lot of discussion, associate members, I'll get to the supporting members in a moment, but associate members or manufacturers that meet some but not all of the requirements. And those are folks that we're trying to encourage to go ahead and get their ISO certification or their CE or whatever the, the need might be. The current supporting members in terms of the training agencies are INTD, IART, PADI, PSA. Silent Diving isn't a training agency, but they, they put a lot of effort into it, and TDI. Our officers that we initially elected basically are held by company positions. Kim Makusha of Jetsum is our president. Paul Raymakers from Revo is our vice president. Bruce Partridge from Shearwater, secretary, and Interspace Systems is serving as treasurer. So to date, it doesn't look like we've done a whole lot on the public front, but a lot of what we did took quite a little bit of time. We organized as a nonprofit organization, which meant we had to agree on bylaws, which was, was quite an interesting process. We had to put a budget in place. We're a, vote, a very low budget operation. We exist on basically the dues of the members, and we got to file with the IRS for nonprofit status. What we've done, initially we started out with an email listserv so that members could communicate. You know, we've got basically manufacturers and training agencies spread around the world. We're in different time zones. Everybody's extremely busy. And face-to-face -face time happens about twice a year. Everything else is done by email. And now uh, we have uh, member forums. We've just started opening the member forums. We have one open area to which we've invited some, some guests like Simon Mitchell to help us in technical areas. One of the things that you know we've been trying to do is what are the things that we can do today and this year to improve safety? There's lots of areas to discuss, lots of things that can be done. But fundamentally, you know, we decided we need manufacturers need to establish their minimum training standards for their unit. And this is in cooperation with the agencies. We need to work closely with the agencies to make sure they get timely information about updates to our units. Procedures for accident investigation, data logging, these are all very serious questions. At the meeting yesterday of the manufacturers and the agencies, we, we had some further discussions on this. And Bruce, I don't know if you got my text, but all the proposals passed. So what we've adopted, what's coming out of this meeting is resolutions that if you're a member of RISA, you will provide checklists for your equipment. If you're a member of RISA, you will produce a sticker warning users to use that checklist and advise them of the location of that checklist in the box. It will be the first thing they see when they open the box. That sticker will look consistent across any unit sold by a RISA member. All RISA manufacturers will provide protocols for first responders and accident excuse me, investigations. This is to assist the Coast Guard and other first responders of what to do with the unit to safeguard the information. One of the biggest problems we have today 
is we're not getting enough qualified information out of the accidents to fully determine the root cause. Okay, the other thing we have adopted as a statement, we're not an enforcement agency, so we can't enforce it, but we're gonna get really mean about it. Manufacturers must be involved in accident investigations. We don't need to touch the equipment, but more and more rebreathers have black boxes. Those that don't will probably have them in the next year. Agencies need assistance in getting that information. They need assistance in determining whether the unit is a correct configuration or not. Some agencies have a lot of resources in those areas, others do not. There's a lot of precedent for this with the NTSB in the aviation industry, and there's no reason there can't be a precedent for this in the rebreather industry. These are complex devices. So the bottom line is, and we had a quite a long discussion about this yesterday, is there are a lot of great instructors, there are a lot of great divers. The profile for fatalities typically is an older, experienced diver. Oftentimes, the triggering event is something that should not have happened. The question is, how are we gonna stop that? And we've, I think we've almost reached violent agreement that we can train very rigorously, we can enforce checklists in the training environment, and we can do all of these things, but if that falls apart after training, all is lost. Students are not dying in training. Student, newly formed divers aren't necessarily dying. The people we're seeing dying are the experienced divers, three years after training, five years after training, instructors. It's a culture problem and it's got to stop. And so our job is to try and determine ways that we can assist with that. Working with the training agencies, working with the instructors, working with other people in the industry to change the mentality. Any questions? Gareth Locke from uh, Cognitas. You say um, a, a large percentage of your, your diving population is already out there. What are we gonna do to address that population? Your new buys or your new sells, you can do that. Mm -hmm. But how do you, how do you go and address that population? Excellent question, and it's a huge problem. Right now, there's a lot of rebreathers out there. Andy and uh, TDI and INTD gave an excellent presentation earlier about the number of divers. 30,000 divers certified, or 30,000 certifications issued since 1990, an average of 1,800 certifications issued per year. Divide that by the number of units, and one of the things that we're seeing is there are there's a big secondary market out there. People buying used units. You know, usually the first rebreather you you buy isn't your last. We see the initial purchase. We don't necessarily see the secondary purchases. And like you say, what do we do about the guys that are out there? It needs to be a cultural change, and it's going to start with the newer generation of divers coming up. It's going to start with the instructors. It, it, we get a chance to reinforce it in continuing education when they go to Normoxic or advanced trimix modules. But ultimately, where it's gonna make the difference is at the dive site, at the shoreside dive site, at the dive boat, when rebreather divers see other rebreather divers setting up their unit without a checklist, they see other divers not pre-breathing and that sort of thing, they say, stop, you're not diving. We're not diving with you, okay? If you're sitting on a big heavy jet, and you see a drunk captain start crawling into the cockpit, are you gonna sit there and go on that flight? No. You're gonna say something, you're gonna do something. And this is what's critical. We're watching these things happen. And, I mean, does, has anybody in here known of anybody that's been lost in an accident? Raise your hand. Look around. There is no reason for this. Any other questions? Okay, thanks.